Hello. Welcome to this Remembrance Day event, centered around readings from my book, After Paris. Thank you for joining me. I'm so pleased to spend time with you. Let me take you through what the next half hour looks like. First, a very short bio so you know who I am. Then we'll kick it off with an introduction to the setting and background of my book. From there, we'll go into the first of three short readings. After the first reading, I'll share with you a couple of questions that I most often get asked along with my responses. Hopefully then, you'll be ready for my second reading, which takes my main character to a CCS. Don't know what that is? Stay tuned. For the third reading, I'll take you to November 11th, 1918 in Paris. You'll see the celebrations and walk in the footsteps of my main character, Lisbeth, as she experiences the day that we have come to commemorate every year at this time. And then we'll close out the event with a couple of thoughts about Remembrance Day 2020. I hope you enjoy the event. And again, thank you for joining me today. I am a first-generation Canadian of Dutch parents. I was born in Nova Scotia, Canada. I have published three historical fiction novels and one non-fiction military history. My debut novel, Family Business, was shortlisted for the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize. My latest novel, Torn Asunder, has garnered several Reader's Awards, including the most recent, an honorable mention for historical fiction, in the Reader's Favourite International Book Contest. I spent 10 years in the Canadian Forces, retiring as a warrant officer. I have a BA in English Literature from Trent University in beautiful Peterborough, Ontario, and I live in rural Ontario with my Great Pyrenees and Golden Retriever. In the summer of 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, was assassinated, which triggered a chain of events that resulted in World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. Alliances were formed which pitted the allies of France, Great Britain, and Russia against Germany and Austria-Hungary. By the end of the war, over 9 million soldiers had been killed, including 61,000 Canadians, and another 21 million wounded, including 172,000 Canadians. The Netherlands was neutral during this war, but they did contribute. Many benevolent societies stepped up to provide medical support in the form of doctors and nurses, ambulances, supplies and medicine. It was through this support that the Netherlands Ambulance Service in France came to form a hospital in the location of a beautiful restaurant called Le Pré Catalan in the middle of the park of the Bois de Boulogne in Paris. The building was transformed into a hospital for the duration of the war, staffed by Dutch medical teams and supplied by Dutch resources. And so it was that Lisbeth Swart my main character, and her sister Alida volunteered their services as nurses and traveled to Paris. Spring 1916, arrival in Paris. Lisbeth paused to savor the heady fragrance of the mild Parisian afternoon, a welcome contrast to the smell of winter weary travelers of the Amsterdam train station where she had shivered with a fleeting sense that she was making a terrible mistake. She could have turned back then but instead she had gripped the medical bag and pulled herself up into the crowded train turning her back as her sister Alida gave one last hug to each of their grim-faced parents before joining her. Lisbeth's mind raced with the fragmented thoughts of the past five days. Her stomach was settled now, 
but her heart still pounded with the same excitement as when she'd boarded the train with four other nurses, including her sister, and one doctor. The dirt, sweat, and general griminess of the long, exhausting journey by train and by ship through Folkestone and Dieppe clung to her now, making her itch. But all that melted away as she comprehended that finally she was here, in Paris. The March sun was warm and the breeze carried the scent of budding flowers to Lisbeth as she stood beside her sister on the wide gravel boulevard, gazing at the hospital. Its beauty was deceptive, hiding like a sepulchre, the horrors that she knew would be within. Lisbeth blinked, taking in the grandeur of the building, shining whitely in the sun. Le Pré Catalan, in the Bois de Boulogne, now transformed into a hospital for the duration of the war, still retained the splendor that made it a famous restaurant. A man on the third floor looked down at them, seeming to study the new arrivals. He appeared small, framed in the tall windows. Lisbeth looked away, unsettled. It's beautiful, isn't it? Alida opened her arms to gesture at the magnificent rounded pavilion. Lisbeth nodded. Did you see that man? She tilted back her head to look up at the third floor window again. Alida shook her head. I didn't see anyone. Come, we're going in. Alida's voice quavered and she crowded forward to stay with the group. She glanced back over her shoulder at her sister. Lisbeth smiled at Alida, stood for another second, then followed the others a few steps behind. She caught up as they gathered in the foyer in front of the matron, a thin woman dressed all in crisp white with a high, stiff collar. A younger nurse holding a clipboard stood by matron's side. Matron waited to speak as a tired-looking man wearing what was once a white coat but now stained with rusty brown and red, separated the new doctor from the group and led him away. Welcome, I'm Matron Hoff, and this is Sister McIsaac. I'm going to have Sister show you where you are staying and give you half an hour to get settled. Then we'll meet back here for a short tour and orders. Matron turned away, then back again. You're lucky. It's a bit quiet at the moment, so you'll have time to catch your breath, but it won't last. She nodded and hurried off. One of the questions I get asked most frequently is what inspired this book. I love telling people how my grandmother, Mary Thompson, was a Dutch nurse who went to work in World War I in Paris. She left a photo album chronicling her time there, and it's the album that really inspired my book. This isn't her story, but based on the photos, many of the experiences that my character goes through would have mirrored her experiences. To see my grandmother's carefully handwritten notations on the back of photos continues to be a thrill for me, and I'm happy to share some of those photos with you today. One more question I've been asked is, how are readers responding to the book? In general, historical fiction is a very popular genre. People continue to enjoy it when history comes to life for them in such an accessible way. But my very favorite response came from a reader in California by the name of Lori. When she discovered After Paris, she reached out to me to let me know that her grandmother had also been a Dutch nurse and had worked in Paris at the same hospital at Le Pré Catalan. We both sifted through our photos and came to realize that not only would the two women have known each other, they were clearly friends. Her grandmother went by the nickname of Toe, and there 
in an old photo taken by my grandmother was a shot of her friend, Toe. Further evidence of the friendship came from another woman, this time from Portugal. That woman, Margarita, is an archivist at a foundation, and she had some archival information about World War I staff at the hospital. There was my grandmother's name, along with Lori's grandmother, Warnsink, one after the other. Anyone who has gone through a military pay parade knows that it isn't necessarily in alphabetical order. You tend to line up with your pal to have a chat as you shuffle forward. I know because I used to be the paymaster in my regiment so many years ago when pay parades were still a thing. All this to say that in response to After Paris, I couldn't be more delighted. But my greatest pleasure is in knowing how a book can not only bring a story to readers, but can become part of the story itself with its effect on the audience. I think of it as throwing a stone into water and seeing how the ripples spread out to distant destinations. The next reading takes place when Lisbeth has been loaned out to a casualty clearing station, or CCS, leaving her sister, along with her sweetheart, Max, behind in Paris. A CCS is a medical facility located quite close to the front lines. Casualties would be transported from the regimental aid posts in the combat zone back to the CCS for treatment or for further transportation to a hospital, such as one in Paris, where Lisbeth usually worked, or back to England. Enjoy the reading. Lisbeth scratched absently at her scalp. Then, realizing what she was doing, she slid her fingers through her hair, feeling for lice, before returning to her letter. Dear Alida, Thank you for your letter. It was forwarded from number, Lisbeth knew by now that any reference to actual names or places would probably be blacked out, so she just left the information out. By now you will have received my note and know that we have been transferred to a CCS. I'm quite well and there's no need to worry. Lisbeth stopped and looked around. Margaret and I have comfortable billets here. It's under canvas but there are electric lights and a wooden floor, so really very civilized, only rather chilly. It's amazing to me how clean and organized things are. I imagined that it would be all dirt and flies, but it isn't. I'm working with amputees, so I'm using the Carl Dakin training I took, and it does seem to be very helpful. It gets rather messy and we are constantly changing the sheets, but the flushing of the wounds every few hours with Dakin's solution really makes a difference in keeping the sepsis at bay. I think my biggest horror is all the lice. By the time patients get to Paris, most of the time they've been deloused, but here the little graybacks are rampant. The other thing to get used to is the noise. There's no hiding the fact that we are closer to the front here than I've been before. It seems, from talking to some of the girls, that most nights when there is a moon, Fritz flies overhead on his air raids. Sometimes he drops his bombs here, despite our big red crosses. And then all the nurses are moved into the chateau with nine to a room. Luckily, we haven't had that happen in our few nights here yet. When the sisters who are posted here are well again, I'll be back. Try not to worry, write soon and give me your news. Love, Lise. Lisbeth folded the letter and took out a fresh sheet to write to Max. Dear Max, by now you will have heard that Margaret and I have been temporarily posted. Lisbeth paused and imagined Max reading her letter. He would run his hand through his hair as he did when he was worried. She smiled when she thought of him. What could she write that would let him know that she was thinking of him, yet not be embarrassing? Your counterparts here are doing a fairly good job managing things. We only have patients who are quite serious. 
The ones who are not so bad are kept back and dealt with at the frontline ambulance stations. The ones who are serious but can be moved get put on a train pretty quickly and sent forward to you. And that leaves us with those whose wounds threaten life and limb. We have an operating theater with two beds that runs 24 hours a day. The surgeons work 16 hours on and eight hours off, as do we all. I often think of your efficient organization, which ensures that we always have everything we need. It isn't the same here, sadly. Supplies run short regularly. Right now, it seems to be syringes. We have been reusing them and treat them like gold. Well, Max, as I say, I think of you and know that we'll have lots to talk about when I next see you. Until then, take care. Yours, Lisbeth. Lisbeth looked up at the night sky as she walked with an armload of clean sheets from the laundry back towards her ward. Planes had been going back and forth several times and now she could hear them coming again, a buzzing sound that grew into a drone. The clouds were closing in over the moon and with every step the light waned. Boom! The explosion threw Lisbeth to the ground and she lay stunned for a moment. She shook her head as she jumped up and ran to her ward, hardly hearing her own voice through the noise. She felt as if she'd been struck partially deaf. Are you all right, boys? There were lots of groans followed by a chorus of, don't bother about us and yes, fine. At the, as the hospital lights were out, but the sky was full of searchlights and bursting fireworks and the anti, from the anti-aircraft artillery. She raced through the ward and out again on her way to the next ward where the chest and abdomen injuries were kept. Running through the semi-darkness, she tumbled into a large bomb crater. Lisbeth put her hands down on the ground to push herself up again. They sunk into soft, oily clay. What is this? She managed to clamber her way out of the five foot deep hole and it was only when she pulled her handkerchief out of her pocket to give her hands a quick wipe that she realized her hands were covered in blood up to her wrists. She refused to think of whose body had been down in the crater with her. There was no helping him now. She, she hurried on to the next ward where she met up with the Padre. He looked at the blood on her uniform. Are you all right, sister? She nodded, yes, fine, Padre, it's not my blood. You should go to the chateau and take cover. She pushed past him and reached for the handle of a stretcher poking out from under a torn flap of canvas. There are men here who need me. She tugged on the stretcher and the splintered handle came away in her hand, making her stumble backwards into the Padre. He leaned down and helped to pull the stretcher free, but the patient on it was dead. Lisbeth tipped the stretcher to roll the body off. She grasped the one broken handle and the other good one on her end. Come, Padre, grab the other end. Together, Lisbeth and the Padre made their way through the ward, trading the broken stretcher for a whole one they came across. They found an orderly lying on the ground, one of his legs completely gone. They carried him to the surgery, which had escaped damage and was in full operation already. An emergency generator had been started, providing enough light with which to work. Lisbeth worked through helping patients back into their beds. She redressed wounds that had opened. She carried and lifted bodies and body parts. It was full daylight by the time order was mostly restored. Margaret found her and they stepped outside into the autumn sunshine. Lisbeth looked at Margaret. Do I look as bad as you? Margaret looked down at herself. Yes, I would say that you do. Lisbeth rubbed her hands against her once white apron. I'm going to find some hot water to wash myself and my clothes. Margaret nodded. And then we'll find something to eat. I met up with Cook somewhere during the night and he was cursing because the bombs had put out his fire. He must have gotten everything up and running again because I saw oatmeal and tea going around the ward. Suddenly, Lisbeth's stomach was growling. That sounds heavenly if I can stay awake long enough. The two of them went off to beg some hot water from the kitchen as their first priority.
November 1918. At 11 a.m. on the 11th of November, the church bells began ringing. Lisbeth peered out into the fog that clung to the trees and bushes outside the Pre Catalan, but could see little. The swell of noise grew as the horns of trucks joined the church bells. Inside the hospital, nurses and patients alike shouted, Hurrah! Hurrah! And is it true? Lisbeth was passing the bottom of the wide main staircase when Max came bounding down from his office. She called up when he was still only halfway down. Well, is it? Is it over? He reached her and swept her into a hug. It is. At five o'clock this morning in General Foch's railway carriage, it was agreed that all fighting would stop. It's over. Lisbeth's eyes burned and her voice caught. Thank God. Lisbeth circulated through the wards, stopping to talk to patients everywhere. Yes, it's true. It's really over. She patted a young Scot on the shoulder as he cried. Why couldn't it be over last week? Lisbeth adjusted the frame, holding the stump of his amputated leg. I know. There was really nothing else to say. An hour later, after the first frenzy was over and the patients were settling back, exhausted from their excitement, Lisbeth made her way up to Max's office. He was back at work, but pushed it aside to come and perch on the edge of his desk as she entered. She took his hand. Max, will you be able to get away later this afternoon so we can go downtown? We'll make time. This is the biggest event of our lives. When can you get away? She lifted the watch pin to her bodice. Give me an hour and I'll meet you in the kitchen. He nodded. Three o'clock then. Now let me get back to work. He gave her a smile. She went back down and searched for Alida. Max and I are going into town at three o'clock. Do you want to come along? I'm off in a few minutes and I'm meeting Frank at the front gate. He just sent me a note. Ah, you're young American. Alida shrugged. He's fun to be with. I'm not criticizing. I'm glad you're seeing him. Just don't make plans to be swept off to America. Alida shook her head. Don't worry. I can't wait to just go home again. It's been so long. It was fine going to England a couple of times on leave, but home is all I want now. Dutch voices and food, clean Dutch homes, all of it. It won't be long now. Go and have fun with the celebrations. Perhaps we'll see you there. We'll be down around the Arc de Triomphe. I'm not sure where we'll be. I'll leave it to Max. I just want to be a part of the excitement. When Max and Lisbeth did make their way down to the heart of the city, Lisbeth realized how futile it would be to search for her sister. Every street was packed with people. Max tugged on her hand to pull her out of the way of two jeeps pushing through the crowd, horns blaring, and American soldiers waving their flag as they inched forward. The sea of humanity closed in behind the vehicles, only to part again for a horse-drawn bus. The three horses pacing abreast tossed their heads, nostrils flaring as they pushed through the people. The vehicle was forced to stop every minute or two as the crush of people blocked the route. When it stopped, soldiers leaned out to pull willing girls towards them for a kiss. Lisbeth pointed to a group of men standing on the sidewalk. Look, Max. He turned and they watched as bottles of wine were passed hand to hand around a group of soldiers in uniforms of various allied countries. As soon as one bottle was finished, a new one was uncorked and they started the round again. Max shook his head. Luckily, everyone is in a good mood. They were carried along with the masses of singing, waving, crying people. Every cafe and bar was bursting with crowds of people inhaling glasses of wine and beer. After half an hour of being pushed along, Lisbeth pulled Max to a stop, her back pressed against the wall of the shop. I don't think I can go any further. I feel like I can't breathe. A man stopped beside them and offered Max a cigarette. 
Viva la France! Max took the cigarette and nodded with a smile. Merci. Viva la France. The man grinned and went on, leaving Max and Lisbeth to watch the pandemonium as Ma Max smoked. When he finished, Max pulled Lisbeth's arm through his, holding his other hand firmly down on hers to keep her close. He dipped his head toward the route back home, raising his eyebrows, and she nodded. The noise of trucks and trumpets, shouts and singing was too raucous to allow for conversation. They turned and began to edge their way back toward the metro station. This is one woman's experience of her travels from the World War I battlefields of France through to her home in the Netherlands, and on to the New World in Canada. But Lisbeth's most important and often challenging journey was the painful one of self-discovery, as she navigates from her wartime experiences to wife, mother, and beyond. For Armistice Day, let's remember not only those who didn't come home so many years ago, but also those who bore the scars, both visible and not, from the experiences that they endured as we try to comprehend what the lasting effects might have been on their emotional and psychological health, and for many veterans of more recent conflicts, still continue. When we take the time this November 11th to remember and honor those who put their lives on the line for us, for freedom, for peace, let's also think of those who respond today by risking their own well-being for us. Thank you for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the readings. Free, feel free to connect with me. My details will come in a moment. The sun now, it shines on the green fields of France. There's a warm summer breeze it makes the red poppies dance And look how the sun shines From under the clouds There's no gas, no barbed wire There's no gun firing now But here in this graveyard It's still no man's land The countless white crosses Stand mute in the sand to man's blind indifference To his fellow man To a whole generation That were butchered and damned They beat the drum slowly They play the fight lowly They sound the death march As they load you down Then the band play the last post in chorus the pipes, play the flowers of the fallen, 